Introduction of Irenaeus Against Heresies This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book One, translated by Alexander Roberts and William H. Rombo. Introductory Notice the work of Irenaeus against heresies is one of the most precious remains of early Christian antiquity. It is devoted, on the one hand, to an account and refutation of those multiform Gnostic heresies which prevailed in the latter half of the second century, and on the other hand, to an exposition and defense of the Catholic faith. In the prosecution of this plan, the author divides his work into five books. The first of these contains a minute description of the tenets of the various heretical sects, with occasional brief remarks in illustration of their absurdity, and in confirmation of the truth to which they were opposed. In the second book, Irenaeus proceeds to a more complete demolition of those heresies which he has already explained, and argues at great length against them, on grounds principally of reason. The three remaining books set forth more directly the true doctrines of Revelation as being an utter antagonism to the views held by the Gnostic teachers. In the course of this argument, many passages of scripture are quoted and commented on, many interesting statements are made bearing on the rule of faith, and much important light is shed on the doctrines held, as well as to the practices observed, by the church of the second century. It may be made matter of regret that so large a portion of the work of Irenaeus is given to an exposition of the manifold Gnostic speculations. Nothing more absurd than these has probably been imagined by rational beings. Some ingenious and learned men have indeed endeavored to reconcile the wild theories of these heretics with the principles of reason. But, as Bishop K. remarks, quote, a more arduous or unpromising undertaking cannot be well conceived. The fundamental object of the Gnostic speculations was doubtless to solve the two grand problems of all religious philosophy, viz., how to account for the existence of evil, and how to reconcile the finite with the infinite. But these ancient theories were not more successful in grappling with such questions than have been their successors in modern times. And by giving loose reins to their imagination, they built up the most incongruous and ridiculous systems, while, by deserting the guidance of scripture, they were betrayed into the most pernicious and extravagant errors. Accordingly, the patience of the reader is sorely tried, in following our author through those mazes of absurdity which he treads, in explaining and refuting these Gnostic speculations. This is especially felt in the perusal of the first two books, which, as has been said, are principally devoted to an exposition and subversion of the various heretical systems. But the vagaries of the human mind, however melancholy in themselves, are never altogether destitute of instruction. And in dealing with those set before us in this work, we have not only the satisfaction of becoming acquainted with the currents of thought prevalent in these early times, but we obtain much valuable information regarding the primitive church, which, had it not been for these heretical schemes, might never have reached our day. Not a little of what is contained in the following pages will seem most unintelligible to the English reader, and it is scarcely more comprehensible to those who have pondered long on the original. We have inserted brief notes of explanation where these seemed specially necessary. But we have not thought it worth while to devote a great deal of space to the elucidation of those obscure Gnostic views, which, in so many varying forms, are set forth in this work. For the same reason, we give here no account of the origin, history, and successive phases of Gnosticism. Those who wish to know the views of the learned on these points may consult the writings of Neander, Bauer, and others among the Germans, or the lectures of Dr. Burton in English, 
while a succinct description of the whole matter will be found in the Preliminary Observations on the Gnostic System, prefixed to Harvey's edition of Irenaeus. The great work of Irenaeus, now for the first time translated into English, is unfortunately no longer extant in the original. It has come down to us only in the ancient Latin version, with the exception of the greater part of the first book, which has been preserved in the original Greek, through means of copious quotations made by Hippolytus and Epiphanius. The text, both Latin and Greek, is often most uncertain. Only three manuscripts of the work, Against Heresies, are at present known to exist. Others, however, were used in the earliest printed editions put forth by Erasmus. And as these codices were more ancient than any now available, it is greatly to be regretted that they have disappeared or perished. One of our difficulties throughout has been to fix the readings we should adopt, especially in the first book. Varieties of reading, actual or conjectural, have been noted only when some point of special importance seemed to be involved. After the text has been settled, according to the best judgment which can be formed, the work of translation remains, and that is, in this case, a matter of no small difficulty. Irenaeus, even in the original Greek, is often a very obscure writer. At times he expresses himself with remarkable clearness and terseness, but, upon the whole, his style is very involved and prolix. And the Latin version adds to these difficulties of the original, by being itself of the most barbarous character. In fact, it is often necessary to make a conjectural retranslation of it into Greek, in order to obtain some inkling of what the author wrote. Dodwell supposes this Latin version to have been made about the end of the fourth century, but as Tertullian seems to have used it, we must rather place it in the beginning of the third. Its author is unknown, but he was certainly little qualified for his task. We have endeavored to give as close and accurate a translation of the work as possible, but there are not a few passages in which a guess can only be made as to the probable meaning. Irenaeus had manifestly taken great pains to make himself acquainted with the various heretical systems which he describes. His mode of exposing and refuting these is generally very effective. It is plain that he possessed a good share of learning, and that he had a firm grasp of the doctrines of Scripture. Not unfrequently he indulges in a kind of sarcastic humor, while in vain against the folly and impiety of the heretics. But at times he gives expression to very strange opinions. He is, for example, quite peculiar in imagining that our Lord lived to be an old man, and that his public ministry embraced at least ten years. But though, on these and some other points, the judgment of Irenaeus is clearly at fault, his work contains a vast deal of sound and valuable exposition of scripture, in opposition to the fanciful systems of interpretation which prevailed in his day. We possess only very scanty accounts of the personal history of Irenaeus, it has been generally supposed that he was a native of Smyrna, or some neighboring city, in Asia Minor. Harvey, however, thinks that he was probably born in Syria, and removed in boyhood to Smyrna. He himself tells us that he was in early youth acquainted with Polycarp, the illustrious bishop of that city. A sort of clue is thus furnished as to the date of his birth. Dodwell supposes that he was born so early as A.D. 97, but this is clearly a mistake, and the general date assigned to his birth is somewhere between A.D. 120 and A.D. 140. It is certain that Irenaeus was Bishop of Lyon in France during the latter quarter of the second century. The exact period or circumstances of his ordination cannot be determined. Eusebius states that he was, while yet a presbyter, sent with a letter from certain members of the Church of Lyon, awaiting martyrdom, to Eleutherus, Bishop of Rome, and that he succeeded Pothinus as Bishop of Lyon, probably about A.D. 177. His great work, Against Heresies, was, we learn, written during the episcopate of Eleutherus, 
that is, between A.D. 182 and A.D. 188. For Victor succeeded to the bishopric of Rome in A.D. 189. This new bishop of Rome took very harsh measures for enforcing uniformity throughout the church as to the observance of the paschal solemnities. On account of the severity thus evinced, Irenaeus addressed to him a letter, only a fragment of which remains, warning him that if he persisted in the course on which he had entered, the effect would be to rend the Catholic Church in pieces. The letter had the desired result, and the question was more temperately debated, until finally settled at the Council of Nicaea. The full title of the principal work of Irenaeus, as given by Eusebius, and indicated frequently by the author himself, was a refutation and subversion of knowledge, falsely so called but it is generally referred to under the shorter title against heresies several other smaller treatises are ascribed to irenaeus viz an epistle to florinus of which a small fragment has been preserved in eusebius a treatise on the valentinian ogdoad a work called forth by the paschal controversy entitled on schism and another on science all of which that remain will be found in our next volume of his writings Irenaeus is supposed to have died about A.D. 202, but there is probably no real ground for the statement of Jerome, repeated by subsequent writers, that he suffered martyrdom, since neither Tertullian, nor Eusebius, nor other early authorities make any mention of such a fact. As has already been stated, the first printed copy of our author was given to the world by Erasmus. This was the year 1526. Between that date and 1571, a number of reprints were produced in both folio and octavo. All these contained merely the ancient barbarous Latin version, and were deficient towards the end by five entire chapters. These latter were supplied by the edition of Fuerdent, Professor of Divinity at Paris, which was published in 1575, and went through six subsequent editions. Previously to this, however, Another had been set forth by Galasius, a minister of Geneva, which contained the first portions of the Greek text from Epiphanius. Then in 1702 came the edition of Graba, a learned Prussian who had settled in England. It was published in Oxford, and contained considerable additions to the Greek text with fragments. Ten years after this, there appeared the important Paris edition by the Benedictine monk Mosset, this was reprinted at Venice in the year 1724, in two thin folio volumes, and again at Paris in a large octavo, by the Abbe Migne in 1857. A German edition was published by Stieren in 1853. In the year 1857, there was also brought out a Cambridge edition, by the Reverend Vigan Harvey, in two octavo volumes. The two principal features of this edition are... The additions which have been made to the Greek text from the recently discovered Philosophaumina of Hippolytus, and the further addition of thirty-two fragments of a Syrian version of the Greek text of Irenaeus, culled from the Nitrian collection of Syriac manuscripts in the British Museum. These fragments are of considerable interest, and in some instances rectify the readings of the barbarous Latin version, where, without such aid, it would have been unintelligible. The edition of Harvey will be found constantly referred to in the notes appended to our translation. End of Introduction Preface of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book One This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book One, Translated by Alexander Roberts and William Rambo. Preface 1. Inasmuch as certain men have set the truth aside, and bring in lying words and vain genealogies, which, as the Apostle says, minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, and by means of their craftily constructed plausibilities 
draw away the minds of the inexperienced and take them captive, I have felt constrained, my dear friend, to compose the following treatise in order to expose and counteract their machinations. These men falsify the oracles of God and prove themselves evil interpreters of the good word of revelation. They also overthrow the faith of many by drawing them away under the pretense of superior knowledge from him who rounded and adorned the universe, as if, forsooth, they had something more excellent and sublime to reveal than that God who created the heaven and the earth and all things that are therein. By means of specious and plausible words, they cunningly allure the simple-minded to inquire into their system, but they nevertheless clumsily destroy them, while they initiate them into their blasphemous and impious opinions respecting the demiurge, and these simple ones are unable, even in such a matter, to distinguish falsehood from truth. 2. Error, indeed, is never set forth in its naked deformity, lest, being thus exposed, it should at once be detected. But it is craftily decked out in an attractive dress, so as, by its outward form, to make it appear to the inexperienced, ridiculous as the expression may seem, more true than the truth itself. One far superior to me has well said, in reference to this point, a clever imitation in glass casts contempt, as it were, on that precious jewel, the emerald, which is most highly esteemed by some, unless it come under the eye of one able to test and expose the counterfeit. Or, again, what inexperienced person can with ease detect the presence of brass when it has been mixed up with silver? Lest, therefore, through my neglect, some should be carried off, even as sheep are by wolves, while they perceive not the true character of these men, because they outwardly are covered with sheep's clothing, against whom the Lord has enjoined us to be on our guard. And because their language resembles ours, while their sentiments are very different, I have deemed it my duty, after reading some of the commentaries, as they call them, of the disciples of Valentinus, and after making myself acquainted with their tenets through personal intercourse with some of them, to unfold to thee, my friend, these portentous and profound mysteries which do not fall within the range of every intellect, because all have not sufficiently purged their brains. I do this in order that thou, obtaining an acquaintance with these things, mayest in turn explain them to all those with whom thou art connected, and exhort them to avoid such an abyss of madness and blasphemy against Christ. I intend, then, to the best of my ability, with brevity and clearness, to set forth the opinions of those who are now promulgating heresy. I refer especially to the disciples of Ptolemaeus, whose school may be described as a bud from that of Valentinus. I shall also endeavor, according to my moderate ability, to furnish the means of overthrowing them, by showing how absurd and inconsistent with the truth are their statements. Not that I am practiced either in composition or eloquence, but my feeling of affection prompts me to make known to thee and all thy companions those doctrines which have been kept in concealment until now, but which are at last, through the goodness of God, brought to light. For there is nothing hidden which shall not be revealed, nor secret that shall not be made known. 3. Thou wilt not expect from me, who am resident among the Celtae, and am accustomed for the most part to use a barbarous dialect, any display of rhetoric, which I have never learned, or any excellence of composition, which I have never practiced, or any beauty and persuasiveness of style, to which I make no pretensions. 
but thou wilt accept in a kindly spirit what i in a like spirit write to thee simply truthfully and in my own homely way whilst thou thyself as being more capable than i am wilt expand those ideas of which i send thee as it were only the seminal principles and in the comprehensiveness of thy understanding wilt develop to their full extent the points on which i briefly touch so as to set with power before thy companions those things which i have uttered in weakness in fine as i to gratify thy long-cherished desire for information regarding the tenets of these persons have spared no pains not only to make these doctrines known to thee but also to furnish the means of showing their falsity so shalt thou according to the grace given to thee by the lord prove an earnest and efficient minister to others that men may no longer be drawn away by the plausible system of these heretics which i now proceed to describe End of Book One Preface Chapters One through Three of Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book One translated by alexander roberts and william h rombo chapter one absurd ideas of the disciples of valentinus as to the origin name order and conjugal productions of their fancied ions with the passages of scripture which they adapt to their opinions one they maintain then that in the invisible and ineffable heights above there exists a certain perfect pre-existent ion whom they call proarche propator and bythus and describe as being invisible and incomprehensible eternal and unbegotten he remained throughout innumerable cycles of ages in profound serenity and quiescence there existed along with him enoia whom they also call charis and sigi at last this bythus determined to send forth from himself the beginning of all things and deposited this production which he had resolved to bring forth in his contemporary sigi even as seed is deposited in the womb she then having received this seed and becoming pregnant gave birth to naus who was both similar and equal to him who had produced him and was alone capable of comprehending his father's greatness this nous they call also monogenes and father and the beginning of all things along with him was also produced aletheia and these four constituted the first and first begotten pythagorean tetrad which they also denominate the root of all things for there are first bythus and sigi and then Naus and Aletheia. And Monogenes, perceiving for what purpose he had been produced, also himself sent forth Logos and Zoe, being the father of all those who were to come after him, and the beginning and fashioning of the entire Pleroma. By the conjunction of Logos and Zoe were brought forth Anthropos and Ecclesia, and thus was formed the first begotten ogdoad the root and substance of all things called among them by four names viz bythus and naus and logos and anthropos for each of these is masculo feminine as follows propator was united by conjunction with his enoia then monogenes that is naus with aletheia logos with zoe and anthropos with ecclesia two these ions having been produced for the glory of the father and wishing by their own efforts to effect this object sent forth emanations by means of conjunction logos and zoe 
after producing Anthropos and Ecclesia, sent forth other ten Ions, whose names are the following, Bithias and Mixus, Agaratos and Henosis, Autophias and Hedoni, Asenetos and Syncrasis, Monogenes and Macaria. These are the ten Ions whom they declare to have been produced by Lagos and Zoe. They then add that Anthropos himself, along with Ecclesia, produced twelve Ions, to whom they give the following names, Paracletus and Pistis, Patricos and Elpis, Metricos and Agape, Inos and Synesis, Ecclesiasticus and Macariotes, Theletos and Sophia. 3. Such are the thirty Ions in the erroneous system of these men, and they are described as being wrapped up, so to speak, in silence, and known to none except these professing teachers. Moreover, they declare that this invisible and spiritual pleroma of theirs is tripartite, being divided into an ogdoad, a decad, and a duodecad. And for this reason they affirm it was that the Saviour, for they do not please to call him Lord, did no work in public during the space of thirty years, thus setting forth the mystery of these Ions. They maintain also that these thirty Ions are most plainly indicated in the parable of the labourers sent into the vineyard for some are sent about the first hour others about the third hour others about the sixth hour others about the ninth hour and others about the eleventh hour now if we add up the numbers of the hours here mentioned the sum total will be thirty for one three six nine and eleven when added together form thirty and by the hours they hold that the ions were pointed out while they maintain that these are great and wonderful and hitherto unspeakable mysteries which it is their special function to develop and so they proceed when they find anything in the multitude of things contained in the scriptures which they can adopt and accommodate to their baseless speculations chapter two the propator was known to monogenes alone ambition disturbance and danger into which sophia fell her shapeless offspring she is restored by horos the production of christ and of the holy spirit in order to the completion of the ions manner of the production of jesus one they proceed to tell us that the propator of their scheme was known only to monogenes who sprang from him in other words only to Naus, while to all the others he was invisible and incomprehensible. And according to them, Naus alone took pleasure in contemplating the Father, and exulted in considering his immeasurable greatness, while he also meditated how he might communicate to the rest of the Ions the greatness of the Father, revealing to them how vast and mighty he was, and how he was without beginning beyond comprehension and altogether incapable of being seen but in accordance with the will of the father sigi restrained him because it was his design to lead them all to an acquaintance with the aforesaid propator and to create within them a desire of investigating his nature in like manner the rest of the ions also in a kind of quiet way had a wish to behold the author of their being, and to contemplate that first cause which had no beginning. 2. But there rushed forth in advance of the rest that Ion who was much the latest of them, and was the youngest of the duodecad which sprang from Anthropos and Ecclesia, namely Sophia, and suffered passion apart from the embrace of her consort Theletos this passion indeed first arose among those who were connected with naus and aletheia but passed as by contagion to this degenerate ion who acted under a pretence of love but was in reality influenced by temerity 
because she had not, like Naus, enjoyed communion with the perfect father. This passion, they say, consisted in a desire to search into the nature of the father, for she wished, according to them, to comprehend his greatness. When she could not attain her end, inasmuch as she aimed at an impossibility, and thus became involved in an extreme agony of mind, while both on account of the vast profundity as well as the unsearchable nature of the father, and on account of the love she bore him, she was ever stretching herself forward. There was danger lest she should at last have been absorbed by his sweetness, and resolved into his absolute essence, unless she had met with that power which supports all things, and preserves them outside of the unspeakable greatness. This power they term Horos. By him, they say, she was restrained and supported, and that then, having with difficulty been brought back to herself, she was convinced that the father is incomprehensible, and so laid aside her original design, along with that passion which had arisen within her from the overwhelming influence of her admiration. 3. But others of them fabulously describe the passion and restoration of Sophia as follows. They say that she, having engaged in an impossible and impractical attempt, brought forth an amorphous substance, such as her female nature enabled her to produce. When she looked upon it, her first feeling was one of grief, on account of the imperfection of its generation, and then of fear, lest this should end her own existence. Next she lost, as it were, all command of herself, and was in the greatest perplexity while endeavouring to discover the cause of all this, and in what way she might conceal what had happened. Being greatly harassed by these passions, she at last changed her mind, and endeavoured to return anew to the father. When, however, she in some measure made the attempt, strength failed her, and she became a suppliant of the father. The other Ions, Naus in particular, presented their supplications along with her. And hence they declare material substance had its beginning from ignorance and grief and fear and bewilderment. 4. The father afterwards produces, in his own image, by means of monogenes, the above-mentioned horos, without conjunction, masculo-feminine. For they maintain that sometimes the father acts in conjunction with sigi, but that at other times he shows himself independent both of male and female. And they term this horos both staros and lytrotes, and carpistes, and horothetes, and metagoges. And by this horos they declare that Sophia was purified and established, while she was also restored to her proper conjunction. For her enthymeses, or inborn idea, having been taken away from her, along with its supervening passion, she herself certainly remained within the pleroma. But her enthymesis, with its passion, was separated from her by Horos, fenced off and expelled from that circle. This enthymesis was, no doubt, a spiritual substance, possessing some of the natural tendencies of an ion, but at the same time shapeless and without form, because it had received nothing. And on this account they say that it was an imbecile and feminine production. 5. After this substance had been placed outside of the pleroma of the ions, and its mother restored to her proper conjunction, they tell us that monogenes, acting in accordance with the prudent forethought of the father, gave origin to another conjugal pair, namely Christ and the Holy Spirit, lest any of the ions should fall into a calamity similar to that of Sophia, for the purpose of fortifying and strengthening the pleroma, and who at the same time completed the number of the ions. Christ then instructed them as to the nature of their conjunction, and taught them 
that those who possessed a comprehension of the unbegotten were sufficient for themselves he also announced among them what related to the knowledge of the father namely that he cannot be understood or comprehended nor so much as seen or heard except in so far as he is known by monogenes only and the reason why the rest of the ions possess perpetual existence is found in that part of the father's nature which is incomprehensible but the reason of their origin and formation was situated in that which may be comprehended regarding him that is in the son christ then who had just been produced effected these things among them six but the holy spirit taught them to give thanks on being all rendered equal among themselves and led them to a state of true repose thus then they tell us that the ions were constituted equal to each other in form and sentiment so that all became as nous and logos and anthropos and christus the female ions too became all as aletheia and zoe and spiritus and ecclesia everything then being thus established and brought into a state of perfect rest they next tell us that these beings sang praises with great joy to the propator who himself shared in the abounding exaltation then out of gratitude for the great benefit which had been conferred on them the whole pleroma of the ions with one design and desire and with the concurrence of christ and the holy spirit their father also setting the seal of his approval on their conduct brought together whatever each one had in himself of the greatest beauty and preciousness and uniting all these contributions so as skilfully to blend the whole they produced to the honour and glory of bythus a being of most perfect beauty the very star of the pleroma and the perfect fruit of it namely jesus him they also speak of under the name of saviour and christ and patronymically logos and everything because he was formed from the contributions of all and then we are told that by way of honour angels of the same nature as himself were simultaneously produced to act as his bodyguard chapter three texts of holy scripture used by these heretics to support their opinions one such then is the account they give of what took place within the pleroma such the calamities that flowed from the passion which seized upon the ion who has been named and who was within a little of perishing by being absorbed in the universal substance through her inquisitive searching after the father such the consolidation of that ion from her condition of agony by horos and staros and lytrotes and carpistes and horothetes and metagogies such also is the account of the generation of the later ions namely of the first christ and of the holy spirit both of whom were produced by the father after the repentance of sophia and of the second christ whom they also style saviour who owed his being to the joint contributions of the ions they tell us however that this knowledge has not been openly divulged because all are not capable of receiving it but has been mystically revealed by the saviour through means of parables to those qualified for understanding it this has been done as follows the thirty ions are indicated as we have already remarked by the thirty years during which they say the saviour performed no public act and by the parable of the labourers in the vineyard paul also they affirm very clearly and frequently names these ions and even goes so far as to preserve their order when he says to all the generations of the ions of the ion nay we ourselves when at the giving of thanks we pronounce the words to ions of ions or for ever and ever do set forth these ions and in fine wherever the words ion or ions occur they at once refer them to these things 
2. The production, again, of the duodecad of the Ions is indicated by the fact that the Lord was twelve years of age when he disputed with the teachers of the law, and by the election of the apostles, for of these there were twelve. The other eighteen Ions were made manifest in this way, that the Lord, according to them, conversed with his disciples for eighteen months after his resurrection from the dead. They also affirm that these eighteen ions are strikingly indicated by the first two letters of his name, namely, Iota and Eta. And in like manner, they assert that the ten ions are pointed out by the letter Iota, which begins his name, while, for the same reason, they tell us the Saviour said, One Iota, or one tittle, shall by no means pass away until all be fulfilled. 3. They further maintain that the passion which took place in the case of the twelfth Ion is pointed at by the apostasy of Judas, who was the twelfth apostle, and also by the fact that Christ suffered in the twelfth month. For their opinion is that he continued to preach for one year only after his baptism. The same thing is also most clearly indicated by the case of the woman who suffered from an issue of blood. For after she had been thus afflicted during twelve years, she was healed by the advent of the Saviour, when she had touched the border of his garment. And on this account the Saviour said, Who touched me? Teaching his disciples the mystery which had occurred among the Ions, and the healing of that Ion who had been involved in suffering. For she who had been afflicted twelve years represented that power whose essence, as they narrate, was stretching itself forth and flowing into immensity, and unless she had touched the garment of the sun, that is, Aletheia of the first tetrad, who is denoted by the hem spoken of, she would have been dissolved into the general essence of which she participated. She stopped short, however, and ceased any longer to suffer. For the power that went forth from the sun, and this power they term Horos, healed her and separated the passion from her. 4. They moreover affirm that the Saviour is shown to be derived from all the Ions, and to be in himself everything by the following passage. Every male that openeth the womb, for he, being everything, opened the womb of the enthymesis of the suffering Ion, when it had been expelled from the Pleroma. This they also style the second Ogdoad, of which we shall speak presently. And they state that it was clearly on this account that Paul said, and he himself is all things. And again, all things are to him, and of him are all things. And further, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead. And yet again, all things are gathered together by God in Christ. Thus do they interpret these and any like passages to be found in Scripture. 5. They show, further, that that Horos of theirs, whom they call by a variety of names, has two faculties, the one of supporting and the other of separating, and in so far as he supports and sustains, he is Staros, while in so far as he divides and separates, he is Horos. They then represent the Saviour as having indicated his twofold faculty, first, the sustaining power, when he said, Whosoever doth not bear his cross, or staros, and follow after me, cannot be my disciple. And again, Taking up the cross, follow me. But the separating power, when he said, I came not to send peace, but a sword. They also maintain that John indicated the same thing when he said, The fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge the floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. 
By this declaration he set forth the faculty of Horos. For that fan they explain to be the cross, or staros, which consumes, no doubt, all material objects, as fire does chaff, but it purifies all them that are saved, as a fan does wheat. Moreover, they affirm that the Apostle Paul himself made mention of this cross in the following words. The doctrine of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to us who are saved it is the power of God. And again, God forbid that I should glory in anything save in the cross of Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me, and I unto the world. 6. Such, then, is the account which they all give of their pleroma, and of the formation of the universe, striving, as they do, to adapt the good words of revelation to their own wicked inventions. And it is not only from the writings of the evangelists and the apostles that they endeavor to derive proofs for their opinions by means of perverse interpretations and deceitful expositions, they deal in the same way with the law and the prophets which contain many parables and allegories that can frequently be drawn into various senses according to the kind of exegesis to which they are subjected and others of them with great craftiness adapting such parts of scripture to their own figments lead away captive from the truth those who do not retain a steadfast faith in one god the father almighty and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. End of Book 1, Chapters 1 through 3